welcome to everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for this exciting book launch, this exciting event um, celebrating the new reform Haggadah, a poetry Haggadah, Mishkan HaSeder. It is a gorgeous book. Clearly, I am already deeply engaged in this book. Um, and uh, it, is, it is our honor and our pleasure at Central Synagogue to be hosting this event. Good evening, everybody. I am Rabbi Sarah Berman, Director of Adult Education at Central Synagogue, and it is uh, a joy to be welcoming all of our guests tonight. Um, I have the pleasure of, of uh, introducing um, two of our, our uh, guests, the co-editors of this gorgeous, gorgeous book, this gorgeous volume, um, Jessica Greenbaum, who is one of the co-editors, and Rabbi Hera Person. Um, just a few words about each of them, not a, not a long introduction. Um, Jessica Greenbaum, Jess, is a poet, a teacher, and a social worker. Her poems have appeared in The New Yorker, Poetry Magazine, Yale Review, Paris Review, and she was for 12 years the poetry editor for the literary journal Upstreet. Um, she has published multiple books of her own poetry, um, teaches poetry reading and writing classes around Jewish text for us at Central Synagogue, as well as other, other sites. Um, and she is the recipient of a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship, among other awards. And Rabbi Hera Person is the first woman to act as the chief executive of the Central Conference of American Rabbis. Um, an incredible accomplishment after a career as a, a rabbi and an educator. Um, before coming to the CCAR, Rabbi Person was the editor-in-chief of URJ Books, the, uh, Books and Music, the publishing arm of the reform movement, where she was responsible for the revision of the Torah, a modern commentary, um, and was also the managing editor of the Torah, a women's commentary. Um, Rabbi Person is also um, written and edited additional books and uh, journal articles um, and has published in various anthologies and journals, including, um, among many others, Upstreet, the journal that Jess used to edit. So it is a, an honor and a pleasure to invite uh, Jess and Hera to our virtual stage to introduce us to this gorgeous new Haggadah and to some of the poets whose work brings it to life. Jess and Hera. Thank you so much, Rabbi Berman. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna introduce the book, which here it is in my hands, which is amazing to actually get to hold that is so exciting. Um, Jess and I worked on this for something like four years, if not maybe even a little longer, I'm not sure. But um, it, so it's it's really amazing to actually have it and be able to hold it. Um, the, the, the genesis of this Haggadah um, was, was twofold. One was um, it came out of my family's experience or tradition really of doing a second night Seder, which wasn't the sort of traditional Seder. It wasn't the, the big family Seder, but it became actually the focus of of our Seder experience over the years. And it was, uh, it, it, it is because we still do it, um, a kind of rousing, engaging evening of conversation, discussion, and um, argument in some cases. And like so many people, we would sort of bring different pieces here and there, uh, you know, over the years, this thing got added, this thing. And, um, I, I really, I had this goal of wanting to put together a Haggadah that would include so much of the kind of beauty that I was always searching for, always aspiring to. Beautiful translation and beautiful art and content that made us really dig deep, that, that enabled us to enter the experience of the Seder. You know, the Seder teaches us that we should all feel as if we ourselves have left Egypt, that we ourselves have gone through this experience of exodus, of revelation, of redemption, and, um, you know, that moving from 
degradation to dignity. And so I, I wanted to put together a, a Haggadah that would really enable us for this age to be able to have that experience. And then I began talking with Jess about it. Um, Jess has been a friend for decades at this point, which is kind of an amazing thing to be able to say. And um, we met years ago when we were much younger at the Brooklyn Heights Synagogue. And um, we, we have just been, been fast friends since that time. And I always say that Jess is my personal poet laureate. Um, she's an amazing poet, amazing teacher of poetry. And so we began to have this conversation. And I guess I should say just that we, we've developed a tradition of getting together during Passover, during Cholomoyed Passover to eat leftovers together. And I don't know for sure if it came out of that experience, but, um, but I have a feeling that it might have come out of that <laughs> one of those conversations, but it was just this dream. Like here's this Haggadah that I wanna create and here's my friend, Jess. And how do we how do we bring that together? And we've had other experiences. I mean, we're 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 lucky over the last years. We've had some experiences of connecting poetry to liturgy, and so that's that was all kind of part of the brew that made this Haggadah come to life. I should also just say, um, as you saw, the Haggadah is called Mishkan Haseder, and it is part of the CCR Press. We like to call it our, our Mishkan family. So we've we've published a lot of books that are called Mishkan, a, a lot of liturgical books. Um, and Mishkan can be interpreted in, in lots of different ways. Um, but one of the things that it does is it, it, it's sort of a dwelling place. It's a place where you can come in and, and um, experience the holy, experience the sacred. And so we hope that that is what this Haggadah will enable, a, a new sense of holiness, a new sense of connectedness to Seder, to our um, Passover experience and to that, to all of those themes that are wrapped up in Passover. And so using the Mishkan framework, like our prayer books do, enabled us to, to kind of use that paradigm already established in the prayer books of um, liturgical text paired with poetic text and what, to, to really explore what that conversation can be and how the contemporary poetic text can shed new light and sort of new life really on the historic liturgical texts. So um, I'll stop there and let Jess speak. Hey, Thank you. thanks, Hara. Um, I wanna just take a sec to thank Central Synagogue for being our host and Rabbi Berman who has been guiding me in the last years teaching at Central, but um, you know, when decades ago, um, the Torah Women's Commentary was published and Hara and her editors really changed the canon um, by uplifting women's voices in Torah and also by adding poems, which were these contemporary um, reflections and refractions and a way to um, experience the ancient and the distilled themes of the ancient hour story um, through voices that uh, we related to. And from that moment on, I knew this was going to be my way to authentically study more, learn more, feel more connected. And Central um, Synagogue, uh, Rabbi Buckwald um, and um, Rabbi Auerbach and Rabbi Lev Cohn before Rabbi Berman all made a home for me and guided me in my design of classes doing just what um, the Haggadah does and that the Torah Woman's Commentary did, which is to pair contemporary poems with traditional text as a way to re-see um, those themes and re-understand them. And I have had the privilege over over five years now of getting to work with an astounding, brilliant group of um, lifelong learners at Central. And I just wanna thank um, everybody there for making that home for me and giving me this path that came from the woman's commentary and studying with Hara to, to this moment of working on the Haggadah with her, um, which you know was basically for my part, just completely fun. And for Hara, more of a job job, but um, um, 
I, you know, we, metaphor is one way that we are all written into the text um, because we, none of us have the same image as the other person. So because Judaism is so, so metaphorical, you know, we, we begin in chaos, we move to a garden, um, Sabbath is a bride, the books of, 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 of life are open while the gates of heaven are open, you know, we are going from one image to another and, and really writing ourselves into the traditions and the text via our own uh, way of, of, of envisioning that and, and understanding it. Um, and with all the close reading that is part and parcel of what uh, Jews do with their text, we have, it, I feel like there's this excavation, I feel like there's this network of caverns behind all the texts and these, all these byways that are like, oh, and this is here and this is here. Um, and, and as, you know, as, as Harris said, the, you know, if, if a huge part of Passover, which really does just win the met metaphor count um, of all the holidays, if its instruction is to, is to live it as though, as though it were happening to you, um, we wanted to find poems whose metaphors made that immediate that would offer participants the possibility of really doing what we're asked. We're asked really to change from the beginning of the evening to the end of it, not just being full and tired or whatever, but also to, to somehow envision this metaphorical change, this move from whatever narrow place we began to this, to this, place, of, to this place of promise and freedom. And how do we actually really do that while sitting around the table? So um, our choices were, um, um, you know, really meant to uh, a hope to be like almost like you know the same a little midrash, a little moment, a little like oh this is this is this is what was happening at at that moment. This is one way I can um, through this poem I understand that moment a little better. Um, maybe hopefully um, hopefully there's enough of the poems that people can find a certain amount that ring true for them and bring them closer to what we're doing around, around the Seder table. So thank you everybody for being here. And I'm so really, really proud to have the poets here. Um, there, there is an organic relationship for me between poetry and Judaism, just straight off the bat that we have, that we have, um, that we share a value of separation, that we share a value of tikkun olam, that we share values of turning it and turning it again. And um, I thank all the poets um, in, in the Haggadah and especially Rachel, Judy and Howard for being here. I'm sorry we didn't mention that Tina Chang was ill tonight. I'm sorry she can't be with us, but um, uh, here we are. So I'm so grateful that we are. And I will give it back to you, Hara, now. So Jess, actually, I think- Oh, um, oh, it's me. Yes, yes. giving it back to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was the invisible Tina moment. Um, so um, the, first, the first poet we're gonna speak to is Judy Katz, who's, um, whose poem, <clears throat> Questions from My Tribe in Midlife is on page 61 in the Haggadah. Um, you can read more about Judy in the in the chat, we're putting links to each of the poets' bios because we we want to be talking about other things. But the the um, but I, I think you would find reading um, the two poems of Judy's that are in here and others of her work that her voice is inimitable and it is the genuine and it is the seeker and the questioner and it is the wit and it is. Um, so much of what of, of 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 what engages us and leads us and offers us revelation. So, Judy, I'm wondering if you would um, start by reading questions from my tribe in midlife. Absolutely, 
Thank you, Jess. Thanks for, it's such an honor to be part of this beautiful Seder book. Um, questions for my tribe in midlife. Was it a cloud or a pillar of fire that led you lost people through the desert? And were you lost or merely uncertain as I feel nearly every day now? And when you say wandered, do you mean your time was unstructured and so felt endless? Your looking brought no pleasure? And when you looked, could you see through the cloud or was it like driving through fog on the Cape? And the moisture beating up on your forearm, was that God? And the fire with its bright noise, did it frighten or delight? And how long would this go on anyway, this not being here nor there? Thank you so much, Judy. So um, if we look where the, the placement of this poem um, is across from the, the, the tale of Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Tarfan all staying up. Um, and I wanted to ask Judy how she felt about the placement of her poem in, in that moment of the Seder. Um. Well, it was an interesting spot for me, right in the heart of things. The Magid is the telling of the story. Um, but what really felt kind of great to me <laughs> was that since I grew up in a fairly traditional, like a modern Orthodox Jewish family, strong women and stuff, but um, you know, just to be right there with those five rabbis staying up all night arguing and talking. I just like a woman's voice in there. I'm happy to be in there with them. So, um, so that feels great. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and um, you know, when, we, when you look at this poem, there's just suddenly, it's, it's like poetry itself. Like suddenly everything is you know, everything is resounding with it. Everything in the Seder is resounding with it, even though it wasn't designed for that. And it's just magic that way. Um, I'm wondering, Judy, about um, your sense of the poem in relation to questions and really like in, in terms of the title and the title's relationship to our whole experience of Seder and your experience of this poem in Seder. Yeah. Um, as, as you said, it, you know, it wasn't written for this purpose. Um, I think questions are a lot of what um, drive me and haunt me both in poetry and about Judaism, I'd say, and I'm just living in general. Um, but the way the poem started actually was... Um, I had this idea that because I grew up studying some Jewish texts and then many years later would find, oh, I have like a little piece of text that's coming back to me. And I don't totally remember the context and I don't remember where it came from, but you know, these scraps of buried text are kind of, I'm walking around with them. And I decided I did genuinely have this question, was it a cloud or a pillar of fire that was accompanying these people through the desert? And instead of um, looking it up or trying to find out the answer, I decided that I would take my going memory and make it an asset and just kind of press into what I didn't remember and see what I could find out from whatever associations I had right now with that. So this was a midlife moment. And then when I started writing, I sort of remembered all this language of the desert wandering and, and lost, and it just fed right into the place that I was. So even though, so it just became a series of questions. And even though it began with, um, you know, speaking to, was it a cloud or a pillar of fire that led you lost people 
as if I had nothing to do with them. Um, even though it started there, um, it became clear as I was writing it that um, I was very much connected to this experience or this uncertainty. That's, we're just so lucky that we have a poem like this which connects us and um, in, that, in, in that same way. And when you, you look at it this year, um, you know, there is so much of our pandemic year that is lending itself to our story of this year's Seder, but um, there's always going to be something <laughs> that, how long is this going to be going on? Neither here nor there. But I really appreciate the description of actually writing and learning the self through writing, because that is what we're hoping also that happens at the Seder, that we are going to be learning more of the self as the Seder goes on and more of our relationship to the story. Oh, that's been inside me all along. So thanks, Judy. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And if there's, is there anything else about the poem that maybe I didn't, no, I didn't get I to? Just, one tiny thing is I just wanted to say, I, I, I feel myself and probably this is the case for other people, but that I, um, belong to many tribes, <laughs> the tribe of women and people who have lost their mother and poets and Jews and all of that. But um, this, you know, just focused on this particular tribe, but I feel that we have questions for all of our tribes. Oh, I love that you brought that up because that's another thing the poem does. It says, we are in this together. You know, it might start with you, but then it is I and it is my tribes. And we are in this together um, in, in all our identities. So yeah, thank you. Thanks so much for bringing that up. So Hara. Um... Yep, thank you. Thank you, Judy. That was so beautiful. And Jess, I'm glad you brought that up about the pandemic because as Judy was reading it, I have to say I have a particular love for this poem. I mean, I love them all, um, but uh, I have, as you've actually seen, Judy, I've read this, I've taught this in, in other um, moments where we've been talking about this book. And um, just now when you were reading it, I was thinking, oh my God, that is such a pandemic poem, actually, even if it wasn't intended that way, that, you know, that journey they hear neither here nor there and when are we going to get there? And, you know, um, it, yeah, thank Unstructured you. Unstructured time. Yeah, totally. Um, so Howard, I'm gonna be speaking to you now. Okay. And um, we're gonna look at Howard's poem, Howard Schwartz's poem, which is on page 73. And Howard, would you read it for us, please? Sure. River dream. In the dream, I'm on one side of a river. There's a woman bathing a baby in the cool water on the other side. As evening falls, she places the baby in a basket and sets it afloat to me. Even though she can't see me, she knows I'm here waiting for the basket to arrive. Nor can I see her, but I know she has set it adrift. Thank you so much. And what was it like to hear that we wanted to use this in this kind of a setting in a Haggadah? Well, it was great mm -hmm. uh, since, you know, it comes right out of a biblical passage. The thing is, this was a dream. Mm -hmm. I dreamed this uh, about 10 years ago after I had a stroke and I was in the hospital and I didn't know if this was the end or not. I had this dream and the dream was saying to me, you'll be okay. You'll receive the baby. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a dream growing out of a biblical passage, but that was, that was my dream. Um, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> That's really pretty amazing. Um, what would you, what would your hope be for how this would be used at the Seder or, you know, how this might be talked about at the Seder? 
what what would you imagine? Well, it's been very personalized, even though it's a classic, well-known uh, passage, uh, which is perfectly mirrored on the other page. But, uh, you know, to me, what it does is personalize. It's, it works precisely as I believe that dreams work. Uh, dreams uh, are messages from the unconscious to the consciousness. That's the Jung explanation, which I've always been very happy with. Uh, I, I believe they are messages. I believe in this case, I had a question, which was, am I going to make it? And this dream answered that question, even though I hadn't put it in so many words. Mm -hmm. And I felt much better after that dream. And I felt even better when you all included it. <laughs> That's great. Um, I should say that it's paired with um, the text about the midwives. And I'll, I'll just read that briefly. Um, and I should say all of the translations in the book were done by rabbis uh, Janet and Sheldon Martyr, and they're just unbelievable translators. The midwife said to Pharaoh, it is because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. They have more vitality. They give birth before the midwife arrives. So God was good to the midwives and the people grew many times over and Pharaoh charged his whole people saying, you shall cast into the Nile every son that is born, but every daughter let her live. So your, your poem is the companion to that passage. And one of the things that I love about this poem is that, um, that you create space for all of us, I think, to be that sort of witness to history, your witness also to metaphor, right? That, you know, you're, you're there, even though she can't see me, she knows I'm here waiting for the basket to arrive, nor can I see her, but I know she has set it adrift. And in some ways that's like carving out a space for all of us to be there. And I know, you know, you've, you've just shared that it has this very personal meaning for you but it really, it, it creates a doorway for all of us to come in and be part of the story and to be standing there and to be seeing it. And I, that's just one of the things that I love about it. Um, Can I jump you, in for one sec about something, yeah, Hera, about yes, that? About the being there and um, also about the responsibility of being there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she knows I'm here waiting for the basket to arrive, you know, we are, we are, we are at, and there's a great um, part of the story that is beyond generosity is also about responsibility. And what is it, what is it that is going to need caring for that is going to arrive to us um, yeah. that we need to be ready that's right. Um, we know it's out there and we need to be ready. And I also appreciate that sort of communal use of the poem too. Yeah, I love that idea. And we're all sort of, we're all waiting for it to come, right? It's been set adrift and here we are and like, what's gonna happen? You know, history unfolds in front of that floating basket, right? Um, it's, yeah, very powerful. Um, Howard, any last thoughts or words about that? No, I, I actually agree with your, your all interpretation of it. Um, you know, that's, that kind of universality is what we want in poetry. Uh, by being personal, we're universal. Right. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank very you. Much. Mm -hmm. Jess, I'll turn to you now. Sure. Um, so now we get to look at Rachel Haddis's poem, one of her two poems on page 117, a poem called New City. And um, I am I'm just gonna read a little bit of the text on the on the opposite page. We um, we're still in Magid um, and and I'll just read some of the translation. Um, so to bring us in peace to many other festive seasons. Take delight in the rebuilding of Jerusalem, recall the ceremonies of old, and then with praise and thanks, 
We bless you for our redemption and for saving our lives. Rachel, will you read New City? With pleasure. I hope everybody can hear me. New City. Winter strains towards spring. A bird is singing in a leafless tree. The river gleams, the sidewalks glint with ice or with a hint of possibility. A blade of sun bisects the afternoon street. In such a slippery spot, I fell, righted myself, stood up, and found myself no longer in the winter, but in a city and a season slightly disguised as ordinary yet transfigured. The grime of dailiness was all rinsed clean. In a leafless tree, a bird was singing. Thank you so much. Um, I should say that Rachel and I go way back from early generosities of hers to me. And it's another, it's another way that so many of us are connected here. Um, and all the poets information is in the chat to see their links and the books, their books um, and other publications. So, you know, uh, Rachel, just, just curious, just if you, about your feeling about this poem and where it is and um, how that, you know, how, how you see that, how it resounds to you. Well, like Judy and I guess like Howard, I didn't write this poem purposefully to, to be here in this Haggadah at this moment, but I want to say to everybody that Jessica is an editor of Genius, and this, is, this Haggadah is, among other things, a wonderful poetry anthology, which manages to ring changes, variations on a theme without being monotonous. And I, there were so many wonderful discoveries for me in this anthology. Um, beyond that, I think there's a feeling of the redemption and the rinsing of the old in the new. Spring has always been a very edgy season. I never as a child understood what spring fever meant. I thought it meant everybody got sick in the spring, which for all I know is what it means. And in fact, right around the time I fell in love with my husband Shalom, who's kind of reintroduced me to Judaism, which is wonderful. I did fall and break my wrist, but, and, and found my woke up in a new world in a way. But like so many poems, and how I was speaking of, of this with the um, end of Judy's poem, this poem is anticipatory, it's proleptic, it's prophetic. It's about some kind of mysterious renewal at that moment of turning between winter and spring, which I was feeling today with you know the bright sunshine and the cold wind. And I feel that every year at this time. Um, New City is also a city in Rockland County where I now have relatives. So everything is new. Um, and that moment when you're looking at the trees, they don't have leaves yet, but you know that they will have leaves and a bird is already singing. It's, it's such an incredible moment. So um, I, I think that, I also think this poem is a dream poem like Howard's poem. That is so interesting to me that many poems tap into some kind of, if I could say, collective unconscious. And I think the journey of Passover and the journey of the Haggadah is so archetypal. We move from some kind of darkness into some kind of light, but there's so much mystery. It's so personal and so universal. And just listening to Jess talk about this book and listening to Hara reminds me of that. There, there's a mystery here. Mm. Um, Rachel, I you know, you, you complimented me as an editor, but it would, be, it would be nigh on impossible with voices like yours and Judy's and Howard's not to put together something that, you know, any poet would aspire to, to reading. So thank you. But when I, the, the, the leafless tree, I just in case people are hearing it and not seeing it, one of the beauties of the poem and one of the sort of amazing, um, you know, particulars of it at this moment is in the second, so it's winter strains towards spring, a bird is singing in a leafless tree. And we, you know, depending on when Passover is, and I guess it's early this year, many trees may still be leafless, but we are on this verge. And then the poem has this middle part, 
you know, right in the middle, in a slippery spot, I fell, righted myself and stood up. So, you know, we, we have this, we, we get to move on and then it ends in a leafless tree, a bird was singing. Um, so the bird singing is what ends and is moving towards. So, and just, you know, there's a really beautiful construction in such a, in, in, in such a space and it does hold so much of the archetype also of um, how am I going to, how, you know, how am I going to get past whatever um, those, those places of danger are? And um, I righted myself and stood up. You know, again, there, there's, I love that it has that part that's, oh, this is, this is for us to do. This, this, is, this is partly for, for us to do. Um, Your sense of um, unknownness and of a riddle. I love that Judy's poem is all in questions. I particularly love that pandemically inflected last question, how long is this gonna go on? And, and Howard's poem, while not a question, is very enigmatic. It's sort of like the answer to a riddle, but we don't quite know. And there's a huge amount of unknownness in these poems, which I think Jess taps right into. It's sort of, it's Wordsworth says somewhere, the soul remembering how she felt, but what she felt remembering not. There's a lot of unknownness and the, the, um, the traditional guidance that the liturgy gives us helps guide us through this huge unknownness. Mm. Wonderful. Oh, Jess, may I jump in for one? Yeah, please. Second? please. Um, I just wanted to say, this is the poem that I remember hearing before I saw the Haggadah. And um, I think to do with that unknownness, I remember the shock of feeling like, the speaker fell down, but the idea of sort of waking up or writing oneself in a new city, slyly disguised as the ordinary, that just, you know, undid it. I feel, I feel so much like, you know, we do the Seder every year. We go through our lives and it's, it's ordinary, but what's that moment where something is transformed or you can't quite Anyway, that was a beautiful moment for me. I think one of the jobs of poetry is to remind us that what looks like ordinariness is really just a disguise. And mm -hmm. it's really not so ordinary. Mm -hmm. And I feel that particularly at this time of year, the, the violent contrast between heat and cold and light and dark and the journey of Passover and Easter and all of that, it's, it's very intense. So, so I, one other thing I just want to, um, you know, talk, say again about the poem from when Rachel read it is the penultimate line of the grime of dailiness was all rinsed clean. And so we are, you know, when we're, or when we are in, at the Seder table and you know how like it, it's, you know, Passover comes and then suddenly bread looks different. It's just like <laughs> things start to look different. Um, and um, that kind of dailiness changes. But also one of these, I, one of these amazing off offerings of Judaism for me is this chance to start again. I mean, even in terms of bread, like, oh, we get to throw out anything on the shelves that like, I'm never gonna use that half box of falafel, like fine, throw it out, fine, you know. Um, and to, 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 to get to have that opportunity um, and that the poem and at this moment reminds us that we, that we have that, um, that with that grime of dailiness all, all was, you know, all rinsed clean, that we have a new, we, we can really consider ourselves in a different place than when we began. Yeah, I, I love that idea also connected to what you're saying about writing, you know, uh, right, I write it, I fell, I write it myself, stood up, because that's also part of that, like, coming back around, you know, we do fall, right, we do slip metaphorically as well as actually sometimes, but, you know, we, we get up again, right, we, we keep going, we keep moving forward, and, and in this case, I mean, we move into spring, like, you know, we move into bird singing and it's, there's so much, there, there's a sort of 
grittiness to it, but there's also this sense of hope here, which you know feels so appropriate in the Seder. Yeah. I think that one of the things Jess has done is collected a lot of poems about springtime and hope and never been sentimental for a moment. And that might be her and that might be the, the quality of the Seder and the quality of the light and the darkness. One problem with anthologies in general is they become repetitious. You think, oh, one more poem about spring. <laughs> and that, that didn't happen here. Well, so I was, thank, I was, you know, ha this was truly a co-editing job and a lot of the poems came through. Right. A lot of the poets I did, didn't know. And that was really so much fun. Um, I think actually Howard's poem came through, through her, but... Um, both the editors, all the editors. Yes, yes. well, I just I needed, needed to say that. But um, so um, I think that is, unless um, anybody wants to say more about any of those poems. Yes. Judy. May I just say one thing about um, Howard's poem, which yeah. I love very much. Um, just speaking of the pandemic and how you read with whatever circumstances going on, but the idea of um, I can't see you, but you have to trust that something from me is coming your way um, and I will receive what you're sending my way. I found that very moving in this moment. So um, before we move on, just, you know, a little also something in terms of, you know, anthologizing and what we bring to the moment, you know, we, 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 most of us come with some years of having been brought to that moment by our ancestors, our family, our friends, and um, really just, um, we're hoping that the, the scope of the poems, uh, which really, um, I hope you'll find very varied. They say, bring everything, you know, bring, bring all your experience, bring everything that could possibly um, illuminate this moment, that could possibly deepen this moment, that could possibly connect you to this whole, to this whole progress of the evening. Um, could I speak just to something in the chat? Um, yeah. Speaking of bringing everything, I mean, uh, Anish Benami has a great question, and it had not occurred to me, frankly, to relate the New City poem and the rebuilding of Jerusalem, but I'll take it. I will take that, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if the editors had that in mind. Yeah, I think that's right. <laughs> I think Hara did. <laughs> um, so, yeah, well, we will, um, Is I, I think, when when are we going to... I think we can move to, to the question period now, if that's okay, okay Ms. Sarah. Yeah, if, if you are ready, we have some great, great questions for yeah. you. Um, uh, <clears throat> and I will, I will read you a couple of them that seem paired um, at a time. So we received um, a question about the process of choosing the poets and the process of matching the poems with the liturgy in the Seder, in the Haggadah itself. Um, can you talk a little bit about those two pieces of the selection process? Yeah, well, I can start off by just saying it was a delicious process. Like, <laughs> I mean, really for several years, Jess and I would meet periodically every couple of weeks with stacks of paper and books of poems and the man and, and the, the liturgical part of the manuscript. and we would read poems and we would try to make connections and see kind of what spoke to what. And, um, and sometimes the fit was right there in front of our faces. Other times it wasn't at all. Um, there, were, there were connections that we, or I should say pages, sections that we really struggled to find good matches for and, and others just fit so well. But it was an amazing experience of working our way through so much fantastic poetry, even poetry that didn't make it into the book. And we wanted the relationship to be not just a superficial relationship, not just, you know, I'm, I'm making this up, but if it says red here, then it should say red in the poem. You know, we, we wanted it to be richer and deeper than that. And we spent a lot of time talking about themes, like what, what are the sort of embedded themes? And, and we came up, I think at one point we had themes for every page of the liturgy. Um, 
And, you know, and where do we find poems that speak to those same ideas or this, you know, similar kinds of metaphors and spring as, as Rachel said, was definitely one of our th overall themes. So was journey and freedom and redemption. There were some, you know, overarching themes and then there were very specific themes as well. Jess, do you wanna talk to that? Um, well, I inherited that, that method because Hara had been using that for um, other, 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 Mishkan, other Mishkan books. Um, so it was great because it came ready-made how she knew how to do it. Um, I think also just that we know that when we're, we know our own questions and our own arguments with the text and that we were also not only looking for things that didn't just exactly pair, but that might, you know, actually be kind of a refraction and not just a reflection. And, um, you know, always thinking, what is it that we're going to, a person is going to really want to grab onto um, as, as a way of connecting even through argument um, with, with the text. And I think Judy's description of why um, questions from my tribe in midlife feel so delicious next to these men talking all night is a perfect one. You know, it's a perfect one. It's like, you know, where, where's the description of the, of the women talking all night? Um, so, um, just to add that, that, that's all I think. Yeah, no, that's actually really, thank you. That's important because we did also, there, there certainly are poems that are, that serve in a way as a counter text. Like there, there were places that really bothered us in some way, or, you know, we wanted to kind of work our way through them. And so sometimes the poems were part of that process. I'll just give one example. Um, in, at my Seder, the whole paradigm of the four children is, is something that there's been a lot of pushback against that uh, around my table over the years. And, you know, even to the extent to which people have said, like, just take it out, you know, it's, it's offensive or it doesn't work, it doesn't make sense. But we weren't going to take it out. And so we worked really hard to figure out, like, what, what poems could we find that open it up in a different way, that talk about it in, in a way that adds... Um, depth and nuance and, um, and, and a new way of approaching those texts. In some cases, they are counter texts. In some cases, um, they're not. But, uh, and I should also say that the commentary does that as well, particularly in that section with the four children. Um, you know, the commentary really kind of punches back sometimes in, in great ways and, you know, goes to that ultimate goal of creating a, a rousing conversation and engagement. It, it might be a good time to just say that the leader of this, whatever Seder uses this Haggadah has to have a very strong hand because um, otherwise people will not get ever get to dinner. They will never come back to your house. They will be like incredibly grumpy. And so really part of the Haggadah is figuring out how you want to use it. And it could be that, you know, it's only one, one side of the page as you go on. And if someone says, oh, but I, I have to read that part where, you know, then it's like, well, you know, maybe that'll be a discussion at dinner. Um, or it could be that you do, you know, if, if it's, it's a group of people who really love the traditional text, do that and save the poems for dinner conversation, which is supposed to be a Pesadika conversation, you know. Um, but but it, it will be just because of everything that was just being said about the what comes up in the sublinear text and how these how the poems have a dialogue with the text. It could really go on in a way that <laughs> be most unpleasant unless you really shape it right. So just wanted yeah. to throw that in. Strong hand and uh, maybe even an outstretched arm. Yes, yes, and <laughs> and some extra hard-boiled eggs in the meantime. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Love it. Um, so uh, uh, questions that don't have to do with Jess's glasses frames and where to get them also include: um, How many poems are there in the book? Um, and and what makes this Haggadah different from all other Haggadahs mm -hmm. besides the poetry? I think there's 80 something poems, Tara, right? Something. Uh, you know what? I should know that number. And yeah, I we should, but we don't. I think there's over 70 poets, and they um, are living and dead, and American and not American. Um, writing in English and not writing in English. Yeah. 
Um, and yeah. otherwise, it's exactly the same as all the other Haggadahs that have ever come out. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think it's different in a lot of ways. I, to us at the CCR Press, I can say this is this is our new standard Haggadah. That's the goal here. Um, we have many Haggadot. They're all wonderful. They're all different. But this is the one that we're hoping really becomes established as sort of the, the standard Haggadah. Um, I think th there's so much going on here. There's the absolutely gorgeous translations, which bring really new life to texts that we may be familiar with, but not in this way. There's the poetry, of course, which is amazing and really uplifts the whole experience. And I think is, is really different to have so much poetry and, and such diverse poetry, so, so many diverse poets. Um, there's the sublinear commentary, which is so rich, so deep, written by many different people. And um, there's sort of historic commentary. There's like a, a kind of social justice commentary. There's spiritual commentary. So there's just so many different kinds of things to pick from. Um, and then the art, I mean, the art is amazing. Um, Toby Khan is the artist and uh, I think it, it's so beautiful. And so I think all of these things together make it a Haggadah that's gonna last for a long time because every year when you go back to it, there's gonna be new things that you decide to focus on that year. Um, you can't possibly focus on all of it as Jess was saying in one year, but, um, but that's gonna keep it fresh for a long time to come. And you can, you can put in your own poems, you know, you can say, oh, I'm not crazy about that poem, but I read a poem. Great, put it in right. there. Um, right. We were, I was asked to, to read Tina's poem. Um, so I'm going to do that. Oh, actually, but before, just before you go there, just following yeah. up on something that, um, that Hera just introduced, we've had a few questions about the artwork and how you chose the artwork, um, how you chose Toby Khan. Um, how you, and again, just like with the poems, how you selected which artwork went where in the, in the Haggadah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I, I also should just say, and as a follow-up to what I was just answering about what makes this Haggadah unique before I get to Toby's work. Um, it's also a Haggadah that I think is the Haggadah of our time. It's a Haggadah that really focuses on issues of freedom, of social justice, of equity. It's frankly feminist. Um, it's, um, it just brings so much of what our sort of collective conversation is and relates that to, to Passover and to the Seder. But to, to get to Toby, um, well, I should give credit to Rabbi Leon Morris, um, who introduced me to Toby and his work. Um, I wanted to find art that was abstract. I didn't want illustration. I wanted art that would be a different kind of doorway into the experience, to the spiritual, to the these deeper meanings and metaphors of Passover. Um, and Toby came highly recommended, um, as I said, by uh, Rabbi Morris. I met Toby and, and we clicked and I had a wonderful afternoon in his studio and I was so energized by by his art um, and by hearing him talk about it. He himself has deep, deep Jewish roots and they, they come out in the work in, in ways that aren't necessarily obvious, right? I mean, it's not like paintings of Jewish stars, I mean, thank God. But, um, you know, there, there is a kind of deep soulfulness to the work and um, so much of his work has to do with landscape, sort of almost like maps and contours and geology and geography. And, and that to me just immediately spoke to these themes of the Seder of the Haggadah, you know, the, the exodus, the, the going out from Egypt, the making our way, the, the journeying, his colors, um, the texture that he uses, it just all, it, it, was, it was a kind of um, very visceral reaction that I had that this is it, this is our guy, this is our artist. And, um, and I'm so happy we made that choice. I think it just, it looks phenomenal and really speaks in it in this beautifully abstract way to the other themes. Jess, did you wanna add Oh any? yeah, so, um, well, no, I, I, I'm, I, I, love its, I love its feelings. I love the way you chose the colors as, you know, the various pieces that were going with the various parts of the Haggadah. 
Um, so I'll read this poem by Tina, which um, is on page 17 and, and is paired with the pouring of water. Um, I just wanna say, since I know we're getting very close to the end of the program and that people may leave, that um, the, the poets who are here, it's worth looking at their, um, what, what we've, their, their links online. Um, the bios just really might've taken too long. There's just too much to say. And, um, but it doesn't mean that you shouldn't know it. And so I do urge people to look at the links for the poets and see um, the other riches that you can find there. So Tina's poem called I Was Locked on page 17. I was locked into a single seed, my future fathoming. I was matter underwater and a sheer hoping when I latched to earth a first withered bloom. A sonic wonder, I sang about the future. I was master of the oxen pulling me toward dawn an existence first in death a state of stillness before beginning, a middle earth of rain. I wore many masks until the right one fit. Then the storm passed and I was wakened by water. <sighs> Mitchell, our Brooklyn Poet Laureate. Wow, we have uh, masks, we have sort of Buddhist songs, <laughs> we have a dream, <laughs> everything. There's more to find. Um, were there any other yeah. questions we should answer or should we? There's, we, have, we have a couple of, um, uh, it seems we have a couple of poets with us tonight who, uh, who wish there had been an open call so that they could have submitted for this, uh, for this volume. But, and I, and I wanted to um, acknowledge that. And there is really one final question I'd love to ask before, before we head to a toast and celebration of this gorgeous, gorgeous book. Um, uh, we have a participant who has said, um, uh, uh, you know, very astutely that they can imagine skipping the entire text of the Haggadah and just reading the poems. Um, <laughs> Do you think that would work? And what do you think would be gained um, or what would be lost in an experience like that? That sounds fun. Um, <laughs> I want to go there. Um, yeah. I think it might be a fun second Seder night or uh, I think it would be interesting to have people then sort of see if they could connect to just what was going on in the poems and sort of understand the same flow of the Seder. Um, and um, that's, I don't know, that's my response. Anybody else? <laughs> yeah, I, I, well, I can say that um, in the few weeks that the book has already been out, I've heard from a lot of people who are telling me that they are reading it as a poetry anthology and that they are using the poems in other settings even before Passover gets here. So that's kind of great. I love that. <laughs> like go read the poetry, you know, and then go buy the poet's books and read more of it. I mean, that's great. Mm -hmm. I think someone wanted to see the artwork. If you could maybe hold up an example. Uh, okay. Um, actually, Hera, I can screen share if you tell me which page Great. you want. Great. Um, well, why don't we do maybe that open, the, like the frontispiece okay. would be nice. Um, it will just take me a moment to get there. Okay. And thank you everybody for your patience. In the meantime, Jess and Hera and Sarah and other poets both present and not present. I just want to say thank you so much for putting this together. I couldn't be happier to be part of it and this evening. Loved hearing everyone's work. It was a great pleasure, yeah. I, I should say that actually Judy, Rachel, and Howard all have poems in other CCR Press books, some liturgical and uh, yeah, I guess mostly liturgical. And um, so thank you. Thank you for 
continually being in our books, whether it was the women's commentary or other books that we've done. Yeah, there you go. That's beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you, you see what I mean by the, the kind of topographical sense of his work. Um, it just, I find it so evocative and moving and it, it's all, there are like almost human forms, but natural forms and and when you look at it more closely than we can really do on the screen, you see like the beautiful texture of the color and, and the, the paint and they're just gorgeous. Uh, Sarah, can you show the one on page 140? Oh, you're stopped. Okay. Anyway, it doesn't matter. That's fine. It's enough. So yeah, shall sure. we sh tell me which page? Oh, 140. Right. Um, That's great. Great. And, and then, uh, Maybe we celebrate. Maybe yeah, we let's do. And I actually should say, because I think the other part of the question you asked earlier was, how did we make the matches with the artwork? I can talk while you try to get the piece up there, Sarah, if you want. Um, was um, so basically, I uh, I was I I took this big stack of all the printouts of the art and a big stack of the manuscript pages, and I sat down for a few days at a big dining room table and just started making matches. And like, literally that's kind of, it, it didn't, I mean, some of those matches changed, but um, was that the one you meant, Jess, or did you mean? No, the but I like that one. No, but um, <laughs> I, but that's, that's nice. Um, Not 148, I thought that's what you said. 140. 140. You're, you're, yeah, but that's great. It's super. No, uh, keep going. There. Yeah. I love that. Hello, sandwich. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, so. And bef before we, we leave the images, um, are the illustrations watercolors? Are they prints? What what medium? Um, they are, um, I, I don't believe that they're watercolor. They are, there are a couple of different medium, but media, but they're, um, th I, they're not watercolor. No, I'm, I'm looking to see if he actually describes them, but he doesn't. Um, and in the back of the book, there's a table with his description. Oh, there are acrylic, acrylic on canvas, acrylic on handmade paper, acrylic on canvas on wood. Um, so yeah, I think that's the answer. Um, and at the very back of the book, a little surprise, there's his Omer counter. So that was kind of a fun, you know, as we as we go off into um, counting the Omer after the Seder, that's, I'll just sort of put this one up. You can oh, yeah. See. Yeah. It's beautiful. Um, yeah. So I really want to thank our guests and our hosts um, in, in the short term and also in the long term um, to both of you who you, you know, who you've been to us, Central, um, to me, and to the poets, um, and also um, Howard as an anthologist himself. Um, his books of, of Miriam's Tambourine and Elijah, Elijah's Violin, I really believe were my daughter's first sort of long reads on their own. Um, and, um, and to everybody who is here, um, so happy if the Haggadah can join with you and your sensibility and your images um, for your shaped spiritual Judaism and your experience in, in, during Passover. Um, so I really want to thank everybody. Yeah, and I, I want to add in some thanks to my friend Jess, who's just the most incredible person to do a book with. And um, such such a gift to basically study poetry at your feet for all this time has been incredible. Um, I really want to thank, of course, Central Synagogue, uh, Brooklyn Heights Synagogue, with that brought us together. And I want to thank everybody at CCR Press: um, Raphael Chaikin, Raquel Fairweather, Debbie Smilo, and Sonia Pills, and um, for all your help and support to get this publication out there and uh, everyone who contributed in all the different ways to it. I also wanna just say we're, we're, um, we've just started putting out a series of videos called Signs and Wonders, which are, they're gonna be six total, Jess is in one of them, but each of them is me speaking to somebody about one particular poem in the book. So you can look for those on Facebook um, 
probably on the CCR Press website too, I imagine. And We're going uh, to actually include that in our follow-up email to all of our participants tonight. Fantastic, perfect. You, you got it all covered. Thank you so much, Sarah. Tara, here's to your vision, which began everything with the Torah Women's Commentary and changed the canon forever and has brought us here to this one. And, um, you know, I couldn't be more fortunate than to be a part of it with you, with you and with you all. Thank you, Des, and I am so fortunate. Thank you. Yeah, Jess. thanks, everybody. Thanks. Hey, thanks to all of you. So let's let's raise our our uh, cups of whatever kind we <laughs> we've got and say l'chaim. 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 May this book be well launched, well loved, well used, and full of stains of wine and matzo crumbs. Right. Next year around real tables, Next year, that's exactly. real hugs and kisses. That's Next year in person. In person. Definitely. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you, everybody. everybody, for being here. Have a wonderful, wonderful evening. And uh, soon, very, very soon, a uh, hug sameach to everybody. Have a great night.